thanks everyone for turning up for, for this panel that I'm very excited about. Uh, we have um, uh, four very distinguished uh, colleagues uh, that you will see here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce them all in one batch. And of course, you will see their pictures here. They are all smiling, which of course was the condition to be on this panel uh, is to smile. Uh, and so I'm going to kick off um, with introducing uh, Dr. Morena Makoena, who is the CEO of um, the Biovac Institute, uh, which of course, as you know, has been um, in the news. Uh, it's really the mandate of Biovac is to really build manufacturing capacity uh, in, in Southern Africa, not just in South Africa. And I think you heard the news recently of Biovac actually striking a couple of deals, uh, one with uh, Sanofi and the other one with uh, Pfizer uh, to basically uh, do technology transfer. The second panelist um, uh, is Professor Petra de Blanche. Uh, she is the managing director of Afrigen Biologics and Vaccines. And of course, which is also the, uh, the hub, the tech transfer hub for the message, messenger RNA technology that we heard about through the COVAX and WHO initiative. Uh, Petro has a tremendous experience uh, and a track record in strategic and operational management uh, of those organizations that really focus on technologies. And she's been really instrumental in the, the government of South Africa about technology strategy development. And as I mentioned earlier, Afrigen is the hub uh, for the uh, messenger RNA transfer technology uh, that we spoke about uh, earlier. Our third speaker is um, uh, Professor Annalisa Williamson uh, from the IDM uh, right here at UCT. She is the South Africa Research Chair uh, in Vaccinology uh, right here. Uh, a position she's held uh, since uh, 2008. Um, uh, Annalisa is extremely well known in, in this field, including um, a track record in developing vaccines, um, uh, particularly in the field of uh, papillomavirus and of course uh, HIV. And you had, of course, the earlier talks from uh, uh, Ed uh, Rubiki uh, about the work in developing uh, COVID uh, vaccines. Finally, but not least, uh, is uh, Professor Greg Asse, um, who is in fact an infectious disease uh, clinician and, and consultant uh, with a particular focus on vaccinology. Uh, Greg was actually the, uh, we had the talk from Tom Scriba. Uh, Greg is actually the, the founding director of the SATVI, the South African TB Vaccine Initiative. Uh, and of course, also the founding director of the, the IDM. So. Tremendous pleasure to, to have my colleagues as part of this. I'm going to kick off with a question they've all been salivating about, they've all been dreaming about, and they can either reinvent the wheel or simply vuvuzela what the Vice Chancellor said. And the Vice Chancellor said the following, for too long, Africa has had to depend on vaccines from elsewhere, particularly the global north. Okay, that's what the Vice Chancellor said. So my question to each one of you, and I'll tell you the order in which you will go. My question is simply this. As per the subject of this particular symposium or webinar, why do we need vaccines in Africa from Africa? Do you want to vuvuzela what the Vice Chancellor said? In which case you can just say whatever, or you want to add to that? So we're going to go in this order. Morena, followed by Petro, Annalisa, and Greg, in the way that I introduced them. So, Morena, over to you. Uh, thanks, Kelly, for the introduction, and I'd like to thank my alma mater, UCT, uh, for inviting me to this panel, and also for my fellow panelists, uh, whom I've known for many years, and many of which I even still work with, now, including Afrigen and also the previous speakers as well. So it's quite nice to see uh, this forum coming together. Um, Kelly, the answer to your question is, you know, in 2019, it would have been extremely difficult for one to be able to explain. But I think uh, COVID has shown us how um, it, it has become self-evident, even those that are not in the healthcare fraternity or in the medical community. 
and I think it's very simple. Um, you know, South Africa, if I can make our countries an example, is assembling BMW and Mercedes and whatever other brands that there are, which are important vehicles to go up and down. However, if you do not have a car, it doesn't mean that that is particularly life threatening. So I think I'd like to emphasize the fact that when we look at manufacturing here, for those that are skeptics and say that we do not need vaccine manufacturing because India and China are doing that, well, I think you know we need to look at uh, vaccines that they are not a commodity, much like cars or other things are. But it's a it's a necessity, and our continent is suffering um, even today in terms of lack of access to vaccines. So. For me, it's really not, uh, you know, I think the, the question is probably, COVID is answering that question. It's, it's unfortunate that we've had to have a tragedy such as the likes of a pandemic to try and answer that. But let me leave it there and hopefully my uh, my fellow panelists can then add in, Kelly. Thank you, Morena. Petro. So firstly, thank you UCT for uh, giving us the opportunity. And Kelly, yes, I Googled all the speakers, but I want to add something if I may. Um, very, very aligned with the vision that Nikkei has communicated in his presentation and, and all the other speakers demonstrating. I want to add a few points, and that's around the economic multipliers, the socio-economic multipliers associated with a manufacturing sector, a successful sustainable manufacturing sector. Yes, the right to human health and the health inequalities that we've seen with COVID-19 is critically important. But what are the socioeconomic um, multipliers? Skills directed and, uh, and impact driven skills and job creation. For this sector, the multipliers are double digits. That is a profound impact. The second one is contribution to GDP. If we look at what the African uh, Union and CDC has been doing around understanding the market shaping, we're talking about the 17 billion US dollar market if we reach the target of 60% vaccine manufacturing for this continent. That, that is huge GDP contribution. The balance of trade, restoring the balance between import and exports by building that, that balance or restoring that ba balance. The other component is enhancing and stimulating innovation, intellectual property creation, technology, uh, products, very aligned with this, this webinar today. Um, and Sue and your team, for me sitting and listening to this webinar, I could see a vertically integrated innovation value chain, and that is fantastic. The in addition to building regulatory capacity and innovation capacity is critical. And then attracting direct foreign investment. I think Patrick Shunshon earlier in his in his presentation demonstrated how much of direct foreign investment will come into the sector. The successes of BioVac recently with 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 their um, um, signing the the arrangements with with Pfizer. There are direct foreign in investment coming onto into this continent as a result of that. So it's more than just health security. It's building a continent and building a sector that is sustainable. Thank you. That's great, Petra. Again, people, we always always forget that it's not just about health. It's also about the business. So thank you for reminding us about the economic aspects that we often don't even talk about, even when we're talking about clinical trials. There is the business side of things as well and job creation. Thank you, Petro, for that. I'm going to turn it over now to Annalisa um, as well. OK, so Africa has unique needs for vaccines that other people will not provide. And I think that that we should be working to provide Africa with those vaccines. So vaccines are important in health security, but they're also important in food security. So we need human vaccines for health security, but we need veterinary vaccines for food security. And animal health is not only important as a food source, but also for those diseases that can spread to humans. And three quarters of emerging pathogens um, come from animals. So I think it's important to also integrate the veterinary vaccines into the human vaccine um, um, ecosystem and, and to start looking at a, at a One Health approach for vaccines. And there, there's a lot of expertise in Africa to, on much more for veterinary vaccines and human vaccines, and we can harvest some of that expertise and move it into human vaccine production. 
That's great. Thank you, Annalise. I think you also just brought in another uh, dimension, which is animal health. And of course, you can take the Petro's um, uh, the point about the economic argument for that, that extend as well to the animal health industry. Last uh, but not least, uh, Greg, um, you can just vuvuzela everything uh, up to you. Yeah, I'll just uh, wave. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not going to talk for for long period of time, but but the issue we've been talking about is the development of vaccines in Africa for Africa. Um, but we should also consider what can we do with respect to technology and innovation in terms of vaccine delivery. You can have all the vaccines in the world, but how? Are you going to get that into the arms of people? And many people in Africa are hard to reach. So, so there's 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 a tremendous range of talent in on the continent who can make contributions in terms of vaccine delivery. And I'm talking about issues around, for example, we know that that vaccines are delivered by injections, and we know that this is a significant operational expense. There's also a risk of needle stick injuries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they are technologies like jet injectors. And in fact, Satvi, uh, Tom Skriber who spoke earlier on, Satvi did a study on a jet injector delivering BCG vaccine in newborn babies a few years ago. Uh, and, and, and that's a tremendous cost saving uh, exercise. Then there are alternatives in terms of, for example, using micro needle patches. Um, and that in itself uh, will save uh, uh, significant resources and you can easily deliver this. It's like a band-aid slapping it onto your arm. So that's another innovative technology that we should be looking at. And then there's the issue of cold chain. Uh, there are a number of, 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 of researchers who are looking at new technologies to enable cold chain uh, um, development. But then there's also the manufacture of thermostable vaccines. We know that they are already to uh, at least uh, uh, internationally accepted thermostable vaccines that don't require uh, uh, close monitoring. Uh, the MEN-A vaccine that's used in the meningococcal belt in, in, in Africa, and the more recently a rotavirus vaccines that have uh, been, been licensed uh, from India. Uh, and there's also some work that's been done recently uh, by researchers in the US looking at developing thermostable uh, COVID vaccines. So, so I think those are all the sort of other related issues because it's not just about the vaccine. It's how do we get vaccines to people? Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, so, so just before we enter into the next section of the discussion, so this is not uh, a series of lectures. This is a conversation that we're having here, uh, albeit through um, uh, a series of questions that I have for the panelists. I want to invite the audience, um, if you could please pop your questions uh, through the Q&A uh, uh, chat space. Uh, so you can see the question and answer uh, button uh, and please feel free to place your questions uh, either of a general nature or specifically to any of my panelists here if you wish uh, those questions to be answered. So I encourage you to do so. All right, so the next part of the discussion um, I have specific questions. Morena and Petro, you are representing the industry, uh, which is really um, on the commercial side of things. And of course, Greg and Annalisa are representing, I guess, not just the academic institution, but also people involved in translational research or translational medicine research. So we're going to move into this next phase. And again, I'm going to follow the same order uh, where each speaker um, I'm going to ask them just a single question um, that they will have to answer. Of course, through a discussion, of course, uh, things will flow naturally from there. So I'm going to kick off first with Morena. And of course, Petro, you can get ready um, after you and Lisa can get ready. And of course, finally, but not least, uh, Greg. So the first one is really for Morena. Of course, you are representing BioVac. Of course, the mandate there is to really um, increase the manufacturing capacity in, in Southern Africa. So my question to you is, before the world really drew its attention to Africa-based manufacturers like BioVac, like Afrigen, um, and then of course COVID hit in about 2019. Last year we went into a lockdown. 
how difficult or easy was it for BioVac to build manufacturing capability locally? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Kelly. It's, uh, I think your question is a very important one. Vaccine manufacturing uh, in Africa prior to COVID has been a very lonely space. Um, you know, it's uh, been ourselves here. We have uh, Institute Posture Dakar in Senegal that's been doing yellow fever. We had some activity in Egypt um, and some activity in Tunisia, but it's really been, you know, a very lonely space. And, you know, my earlier comment uh, is actually real where some people were saying, but what what are you doing? You know, uh, you know, why can't you just import vaccines? Are you mad, you know, in terms of trying to build capability? To some extent, it has to take a little bit of madness, you know, or else, you know, uh, we could just as well go and sell, I don't know, um, uh, sweets or something like that. But it's been a very lonely space. And and the challenge is this folder, Kelly, because and uh, probably many of the audience knows it, but I just want to just maybe re-emphasize it. So firstly, we are in a continent of 1.2 billion people collectively. However, it's not one country like India is or China is, okay? With 54 countries, the majority of which are not purchasing vaccines themselves, which essentially builds a very different, uh, a difficult business case in terms of besides the supply in your own country, how are you going to export and supply others uh, if those are not even buying uh, directly and they're donor dependent? What other countries have done that are of a similar, not, I mean, not the same size, but of a similar nature to South Africa. And I'll use the example of Brazil. I mean, Brazil is a, is a little bit bigger, but they have two vaccine manufacturers and a third now that has entered uh, vaccine manufacture. And, but that's largely because Brazil, the Brazilian government has made it uh, law, somewhat law and policy that they've executed that in order to supply the public market, or uh, you have to manufacture locally. Russia has a similar um, uh, concept, Argentina and Turkey. So, you know, we can all look at the US, we can all look at Europe, but you know, we, we can't make those comparisons. We can't make comparisons with India, it has its own story. China also has its own story. So we really need to look and say, what is it that uh, was happening that we ought to have done? And unfortunately, in our space, our country promotes local manufacture, but they don't insist on it. And so it's been a very difficult space, Kelly. And uh, I'm hoping now with the global community, I mean, South African government is also coming to the front, but I think the global community that uh, that is now surrounding uh, Africa, you know, is really helping. And I'm sure Petro can talk about the real upstream side that she's going to be leading with Afrigen and how the global community is coming to the party, which you know, it would only have been a dream if it was prior to COVID. But maybe I'll leave the rest to uh, to Petra to finish off. Thank you, Morena. Actually, before I get to, 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 to Petro, you actually reminded me of a very important point. Um, and this is the point you made around our government um, promoting local manufacturing but not insisting on it i think that's the same situation when it comes to clinical trials which of course is part of the reason that we have such a low number of clinical trials happening on the continent which of course is really important if we have to derive the the benefits of having uh, whether it's vaccines or therapeutics optimized for our population uh, and that's because uh, governments don't necessarily insist on local clinical trial data before a product is marketed. I think it's very, very important. And it's not just saying it's a nice thing to have, but it's also, it, it's a must have, um, apart from the reasons that you advance, but also Petro's earlier point about the, in the business side of things. Petro, uh, of course, we heard about WHO, Afrigen, Biovac, South African Consortium. We heard about this from the Africa CDC, their involvement, support, and the other COVAX partners about this um, tech transfer hub that's being set up here that Afrigen is hosting and you're leading. Now, we can talk about intellectual property and waiving them and 
we know the history of manufacturing from what Morena mentioned and Afrogens. Um, and of course, we know some of these vaccines are actually based on new technologies that you just can't simply repurpose. So, so we have to think about technology transfer, uh, which of course is not going to happen over time, uh, overnight, I beg your pardon. It's going to be a process. So my question to you, Petro, is how do you think tech transfer and the training hub that's been set up that you are hosting at Afrigen um, will contribute to the long-term goal of sustainable localized supply of vaccines. Again, going back to Moreno's point, we cannot just be encouraging people to do local manufacturing. We've got to insist on that. So that's a question to you, um, Petro. Really, thank you. Before I answer that specifically, let me just also agree that there's a policy environment that is required to create a competitive in initiative, and that's a discussion. That's probably a webinar on its own. But let me go back to the hub. So just for the for the audience's sake, the, the hub contains different components. Objective one is the tech transfer and training component hosted by Afrigen. Objective two is key, that's BioVac with for commercial production. And beyond BioVac, the tech transfer and training hub will, will transfer technology to other nodes on the African continent to enable a network. What this hub will bring in terms of sustainability is number one, skills development, and that is vertically integrated, providing a facility that is suitable and GMP certified to produce clinical trial material. That is essential for the development of, of, of vaccines. And thirdly, the hub has a component which makes it quite unique to any of the other tech transfer and training hubs uh, created, and it's the R&D component. And a lot of what we heard today about UCT and the capabilities is the R&D component is the long-term contribution of the hub. COVID is immediate, it is the catalyst, and it's critical that within the timelines we capacitate and create this true platform of mRNA vaccine production. But beyond that, this variance, there's the development of boosters, there's the development of formulations. Greg, I was so happy to hear you talking about the innovation on the side of final product, nasal applications. We have in the R&D component, we are looking at thermostable mRNA vaccines suitable for the African continent and suitable for low and middle income countries. So the hub has a component which is long term and continued innovation by bringing universities together and innovate across the value chain, utilizing then the GMP facilities at Afrigen, non-GMP at CBER, UCT, to do process development, process optimization, then transfer to GMP environment where you train people to work in a GMP manufacturing facility and transfer that knowledge. So, so the key contribution of the hub is that skills development, bringing facilities and long term creating a platform for innovation. Yeah, I think Petro, you make a very important point that we actually have to tell um, and of course manage this reality that on one hand, uh, you know, we're talking about access to vaccines, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, we're in a pandemic. Uh, we have to share. We have there's an emergency, um, and before we know it, if the majority aren't vaccinated, you know, we could come up with uh, you know variants that might actually compromise uh, progress made in other places. So, in the short term, of course, we're going to have to share. But um, I think you've made the point that this is really, really going to be this is a long term thing. The world doesn't end with COVID. So we have to think about how we can proactively address this manufacturing challenge and the skills um, aspect as well. So thank you for that. So we heard from the presentations we had previously from many of our UCT colleagues talking about the expertise, uh, plant, plant based vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you heard also my introduction. Uh, to analyze, uh, of course, what has made her famous, uh, developing vaccines, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But still, the million dollar question, uh, Annalisa, to you is, so it's one thing to have your expertise and the expertise of other people as well, but do we have, in Africa, do we have the capacity to develop new vaccines? And I'm talking about new vaccines. So this is about really innovation, similar to the point that Greg Asse was making earlier. So that's my question to you. Do we have the capacity to develop new vaccines? Um, in the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine, we have a very long history of making novel candidate vaccines. 
what we really battled with is to actually move them into clinical trials because there's been no capacity to do CGMP manufacture, no pilot, um, no pilot manufacturing capacity in Africa. And when you have to pay someone from outside of Africa, you require very large amounts of money. And so I'm really excited because not only is it becoming acceptable to do preclinical vaccinology, because we are, we're one of the only groups. I mean, if we look at the um, preclinical publications on the continent, the strongest place is UCT when they when they look at the last five years of publications of, of preclinical um, research. So we're very strong on preclinical research, but we have this huge gap on 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 moving all our, our promising candidates into people and we need to do that. And so I'm very excited now. We've, we've heard that BioVax is going to have more capacity. Petra can make um, mRNA vaccines for us. Um, Patrick Sun Shung is going to have a, a whole plant-based um, subunit vaccine manufacturer. So we're now looking at a stage at the end of my career where maybe we'll actually be able to take some of our novel vaccine candidates and move them into clinical trial and actually make a difference. So I, I think that that it's it's a different time now and it's it's very exciting that there's so much momentum and, and so much support now for R and D because there hasn't been in the past it's been there's been quite a lot of support for clinical trials and we're quite strong on clinical trials in Africa, but we haven't been strong on R and D because I mean, on, on preclinical R&D, because it's always been perceived that this should be done off the continent, because why bother in Africa? So the times are changing and I'm excited. That's great. And I'm actually also excited to, to put it on record that you're not coming to the end of your career. You are entering a new <laughs> phase of your career uh, as well. And I think that <laughs> the, the point that you're making, Annalisa, is, is really important. We, we always forget, and I'm going back to Petro's earlier point about the economic aspect of things, that when we talk about R&D, there is the R&D value chain, including what you were describing, Annalisa, around the preclinical space. But there is also the manufacturing value chain. And if we have economies of scale, we don't just talk about manufacturing a product uh, for commercial use or even for clinical trials, but it's also manufacturing for preclinical studies that really provides opportunities for companies to be spun out, you know, all like across the entire value chain. So this interaction between the, the R&D and the manufacturing value chain is really important. And I think that this connection to BioVac Afrigen is really, really critical. Finally, but not least, of course, of course, everything is about the money. How much does it gonna cost us to do this? And I think Greg will tell us uh, how much it's gonna cost us. Um, so Greg, the question is, um, yeah, so what about the, the cost? and affordability of, of vaccines in Africa. And of course, we know about Gavi as well, you know, and, and what they're trying to do. So on one hand, what about the cost? Can we afford it? And what is the role of Gavi in all of this? Thanks, uh, Kelly. Uh, so so what, what, what's this gonna cost us? Five arms, 10 legs? I don't know. Uh, but but let me just reflect on on what's happening with respect to to the current expanded program on immunization, both in Africa uh, and in high income countries. So we know that there's a global inequity with respect to vaccine access. Uh, children in Africa have, on average, uh, access to about eight to ten licensed vaccines, whereas uh, uh, children in, for example, the U.S. or Europe have access to about 15 to 18 licensed vaccines. So as an example, there isn't a single program in Africa where children in the public sector are given hepatitis A vaccine. None of our pregnant women on the continent receive influenza and pertussis vaccines as a routine. And the reason for that is cost of the vaccines. Um, and this vaccine gap is becoming wider and wider. And we see this now with COVID as well. Um, the direct cost of vaccines, and, and, and just talking about South Africa, I mean, we, we, we currently spend about 2.5 billion rand on our immunization program as a whole, 
or direct costs for vaccines, and 50% uh, is with respect to operational uh, issues. So that's 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 a phenomenal amount of money, and we are self-financed. We don't get donations from any other country at all. And as an example, when we introduced the hexavalent uh, combination vaccine, which is a, a DTP pertussis, Haemophilus, hepatitis B, IPV vaccine in 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 2016, and Morena can talk more about this uh, into the country. That increased our vaccine budget by about 15 fold. Just the cost of the vaccines, besides the cost for additional cold chain, um, and hexavalent vaccines aren't available to children in the rest of Africa except for Libya and I think it's Seychelles or Madagascar. And, and that vaccine is important in terms of protecting children, especially with respect to, for example, the global polio eradication campaign. Um, one of the problems is that, that, that um, you know, about 70% of countries uh, in, in, in Africa uh, are, are Gavi supported. And just to give you an example of Tanzania, I mean, Tanzania's population is the same as South Africa. Uh, they have a larger birth court, but the total population uh, is, is probably the same. Uh, they, they spend about 750 million rand on their immunization program, but two thirds of that comes from Gavi and from other donors. They're not self-sufficient. And it raises the point that Moreno made early on. You know, you're gonna make vaccines, who's gonna buy them? Okay, so, so I think that, that any new vaccines that are going to be developed in Africa for Africa needs to be made available at a cost that every single country can afford, every single country on the continent can afford. And I think we've seen the debacle with, uh, with, with, with COVID and with COVAX. I mean, where, you know, less than 10% of people in Africa um, uh, had been vaccinated, whereas, uh, you know, 150% of people theoretically in Canada uh, or in Europe had been vaccinated. So, so cost is a critical issue. And I think, you know, in terms of our discussions around getting this off the ground, we need to be mindful of the fact that we don't want to sell a product that nobody can afford. Thanks, uh, Kelly. Thank you, thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, you know, at the risk of uh, getting fired uh, by my boss, uh, the DVC, um, I'm just watching the time. I don't know how much he's going to allow me to, to go on, but I think it would be remiss of me not to allow the audience to throw in uh, even at least a couple of questions. So if that's OK with the DVC, I'm going to indulge myself. And of course, it's difficult to fire me publicly. Um, um, so I'm, I'm going to just allow the audience to um, just a couple of questions that I think are some very interesting questions here. And I think at the end, um, if I'm allowed a few minutes uh, to just uh, wrap things up. So I'm just going to select two questions that I think in the interest of time. Um, so there is one question here, although it's, I think it's specific to UCT, but I think I would say South Africa. So the question reads as follows. And by the way, to the panelists, um, any of you can, can answer it. So we don't all have to answer it. So, you know, one of you should answer. If there's no volunteer, I'll pick on one of you. It is clear that UCT reads South Africa as a fantastic spectrum of groups working on vaccine design, development and implementation. What can UCT slash South Africa do to build and foster collaborations between the groups? So who's gonna just need one of one panelist to answer that? Who's gonna answer that I burning? Can, who has a burning answer? Uh, Annalisa, I, go for I it. I can answer that. So Africa CDC is is planning to set up hubs where everyone's going to work together, and we're going to have the whole um, vaccine pipeline in place. And there's going to be encouragement to go to to have projects that go from vaccine design all the way through to manufacture and clinical trials. So I, I think that 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 has changed as well, that the time to have um, big collaborations where people actually work together and don't compete with each other. So we all enhance, enhance value is is coming and, and there's a lot of money available now to to encourage those relationships. And, and I think that if you look at the panels that they've set up at Africa CDC, 
they're very broad. There are a lot of different people, um, a lot of people from very different countries and different expertise. And uh, there's a huge amount of goodwill. And I, I think we have to ride that wave to, to get things to happen and, and not just sit in our little silos. Thank Anna. you. Yeah. Thank you, Annalisa. Thank you very much. So, so this, I guess, the final question. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty to, um, first of all, just alert uh, Petro and Morena that one of you should answer it, um, whoever has a burning answer to give. So this is, I think, this question I've chosen it because I think it's it really going to exemplify some of the practical realities that we have to deal with when it comes to manufacturing. The question is, I won't read all of it, it's a very long question, but I'll just uh, give you the essence of the question. So. This is asking about downstream manufacturing. And the question is, how are we going to deal with the logistics of conservation, cold chain stability, and maintenance? Of course, including delivery to the hard to reach places. I hope that question is clear. I think that's a but I think is quite relevant to deal with. And I can see you're both smiling. You both have burning answers. I'll leave it up to you to decide. My colleague goes first. <laughs> then I'll jump in. <laughs> yeah. So I think, Kelly, that's a very important question. You know, one of the somewhat unique aspects that that's, that Biovec has been involved in for a while is uh, working closely with the Department of Health in the delivery of vaccines. I mean, whilst distribution it's not particularly uh, a science, but it allows you to be quite close to what's happening down, you know, instead of just producing a vaccine and that, and then just leaving it out there. And uh, so, we, so, so we know the challenges that EPR program uh, has outlined, and I think Greg has mentioned those, and they still continue. And to some extent, COVID may have even taken us a little bit back. I mean, we're just waiting for the stats to come through, but uh, you know, but I think coverage is a big issue. And you know, there are many. E facets to why coverage is not. Some of it just relates to technology. Uh, if you had asked me whether we can handle a minus 70 degree product uh, pre-COVID, I would have said you are absolutely mad that that's not possible to do. And now we know that we can, okay? Partly through the likes of Pfizer and BioNTech and Moderna and J&J, &J, but we are doing that on a daily basis and it's become a routine delivery mechanism. So I think if we stretch our imagination and say, well, if we can take a minus 70 degree and really take it to the furthest place in South Africa, and we know that there are these technologies that are coming through, being stable um, uh, products, Petro mentioned that mRNA vaccines may come through, Greg has also mentioned that. So I think what we should not lose sight of as much as new technology is often difficult and expensive, but I don't think we should lose hope that those can be made available because that's quite important. I think as manufacturers, the worst thing you want is to manufacture and spend 10 months manufacturing a product for it to expire or to not get to where it is. You know, as much as we're commercial entities, but we are in the vaccine in industry because we want to see those jabs going into arms. And it's, it's so painful when you hear of less coverage, not because of a manufacturer, but because of the downstream elements that need to be there. I think we do need to, we do need to uh, catch up a lot. There are some instances where other African countries that are not even um, affording, you know, that are that are um, have less income than South Africa has done even better than the likes of South Africa, and I think it's about a coordinated will. You know, we have nine provinces; some of them are doing their own thing. We have national, sometimes not co uh, coordinating with provinces. You know, that in itself just needs a dialogue, Kelly. That's all I can say. Thank you, Morena. Petro. A, a quick comment. Um, um, Morena is quite right, but remember, Africa is not one country. Uh, and we are here on a theme which is vaccines for Africa from Africa. Um, I personally believe that the manufacturing component, the platforms, the skills, that, that whole challenge is massive. But the bigger challenge sits on the downstream. It sits in the logistics, the cold chain, and getting these vaccines into people's arms. And that in itself requires an ecosystem, which again, the African CDC and African Union is working to create that ecosystem. I think it's a huge challenge and we can spend another webinar just on that. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. And you can see that we were just not as a, just, just as excited as Annalisa, as she said, we can go on the whole night. Um, 
but unfortunately, especially when you're having fun, time just flies. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, we're going to bring this uh, discussion to um, to a close. And before I hand back to, to my boss, uh, the DVC, I would just want to say this to, before I also thank the speakers, I think it's very, very clear from the presentations that we had um, uh, to from Patrick to the talks in between to the panelists here that we really got to take the lesson that we've learned from COVID and the Ebola virus, because in a way, Africa's response to the COVID pandemic has been shaped by the Ebola infrastructure to some extent. So I think it's about how can we be proactive in building the manufacturing capabilities now, in building the R&D and developing our health systems. I think that's the message going forward so that we can really benefit from the global progress uh, and not just reacting. So really I wanna just thank um, um, my colleagues on the panel, Morena, Petro, Annalisa and Greg, thank you for your time. Thank you for your input.